Hi guys, it's Bob Greenier here and I'm reporting from the fifth day of the conference, uh, the fourth day of presentations. And another stellar day, uh, I really, really enjoyed. Obviously there was uh, Shishkin's presentation that was really looking forward to. Um, but uh, other very interesting uh, presentations were made and the rest of the day was filled with other really interesting discussions and I'm going to take you through those now. So first up was uh, A.V. Uh, uh, Chris Dolinoff, uh, who the previous day had given a, a presentation on the rotation of ball lightning. And one thing I didn't talk about yesterday, uh, just to fill in something I found interesting, is he could show that it was obviously spinning really quite fast because you had a red and blue shift on one side or the other. So uh, that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, but today, uh, the part that really grabbed me and explained why he, this is the guy that went, yeah, when I said something in my presentation, um, he um, essentially was saying that a lot of strange radiation tracks could be explained by like a torus that's tumbling uh, through um, the material. Uh, th that's uh, getting close to my explanation for it. And uh, I hope to be able to do some animations to explain um, uh, by actually running an animation where the structure is able to um, leave an impression on a surface and uh, will actually work to simulate the kind of strange radiation tracks uh, from a, a relatively simple fractal structure. So um, that that was really um, interesting for me because you've had this thing in your head and uh, uh, is, is it real? And uh, then you have someone who's independently come up with something uh, similar. Uh, and then it went on to Shishkin, uh, Alexander Shishkin's work. It's a real highlight of the week for me. Um, and uh, th this guy works at Dubna. Uh, he's a, he's a, you know, very well respected nuclear scientist. Uh, and uh, um, you can really see that there's a sort of reverence uh, for him uh, in people's approach to him and, and so forth. Uh, anyway, he, he mentioned shoulders quite a lot in his presentation and uh, I've seen a, a fair amount of the media out there, but it was nice to hear uh, from him. Uh, but I'll come on to him later in the day because there were some other interactions uh, uh, which were really satisfying uh, to be a part of. Um, uh, then uh, uh, Sergei Antipov uh, uh, showed some dust, cryogenic dusty plasma formations of ball lightning. Um, uh, really uh, with with uh, speed, high speed photography. And if you've seen some of the uh, videos that we've shared of uh, um, George Eagley's uh, dusty plasma reactor, you'll see that actually the, the dust itself glows and it kind of, it can show you the convection that's going on or the mo motion of the, pla uh, the plasma. Um, and he showed this with, with the, the sort of, uh, as you're looking at it, it looks like two counter rotating vortices. Um, anyway, I've got those videos and I'm, I'm hope to be able to put out that presentation uh, uh, in a format that you can see everything in sequence. Uh, but there were some really excellent uh, little video snippets in that uh, about cryogenic. So he, he was calling down to, well, let's put it this way, very, very cold temperatures and then uh, doing the dusty plasma in that, which kind of like, how does that work? But anyway, uh, that's what he was doing. Um, uh, and then uh, there was a, a, a fairly young woman who apparently has been coming a number of times, uh, calls it her family. <laughs> she says that the whole thing has a family ex uh, sort of feeling. And I, and I think that's fair to say, it, it does. You, you feel very comfortable saying what you want to say rather than the, what you think you should be, be saying here. And she gave two presentations. One was kind of like a, a sort of a list of the available um, or, or noted uh, ball lightning uh, sightings recorded on video uh, uh, since the last conference. So she's like, gives an update of those. Uh, and then uh, she uh, did a presentation on natural and artificial long-lived luminescent objects in the atmosphere. And uh, they've actually, I think she's working with a German institute, maybe. Um, anyway, uh, I have that presentation, so you'll be able to see it. Uh, uh, the, the actual slides were in English, so uh, you, when you see the video, you'll be able to understand exactly what's been going on. 
but she actually um, uh, investigated crop circles and simulating crop circles and, and I investigating the uh, property that uh, crop circle um, uh, does something to the ground and, and the crops grow differently for a number of years afterwards. And uh, they actually found, I don't know whether they found, but that, uh, in one um, event they found like a, a slug where I think it may be a lightning strike hit the ground or something. Uh, and they, they analyzed soils from various kind of high lightning regions. And I think this group in Germany ionized um, seeds uh, with some discharge. And the seeds uh, grew faster, stronger, and they suffered less m uh, microbial and fungal or whatever it is, diseases. Uh, they were disease resistant. And and so this is re really, um, it, it's actually uh, uh, something that uh, I've been planning to talk about uh, as part of, you know what, uh, for some time. And uh, it was interesting to see some real studies in, in this area um, uh, being done. That was a really, really unexpected and interesting presentation. And so as soon as I possibly can over the weekend, I'm going to get that out, that recording out to you, as well as Shiskin and Kristalinovs and uh, Antipovs. They're um, really excellent. Uh, and uh, then uh, Emelinov uh, uh, did a presentation on um, his induction heating. I think, I think that's the chat. Maybe I've got that wrong, but uh, there was a tail end uh, presentation there. So uh, a couple, a couple of things I think were missed uh, during the day, but there was uh, enough with the ones that presented uh, to see us through. Then we had an excellent chat. Uh, I've shared one of those uh, videos uh, with uh, Baranov and uh, Zalitipin and uh, um, uh, Alexander Parkamov, uh, and uh, there's there's more to come on that. Uh, that that was a very very stimulating chat. Uh, then after we had lunch and I went and joined on invite uh, Alexander in his room and I had the pleasure of him doing a virtual tour of his laboratory uh, that he ha has and he's had this now for about two and a bit years so when everyone thought he went quiet he actually was uh, tripling his game as it were so when I visited him in February 2015 uh, he was literally working out of a uh, corner of his lounge, uh, some semi-sectioned off uh, in his high-rise apartment. But uh, he has a really swanky lab now. Uh, um, basically, a company that owned this space, they moved into a, uh, uh, it was their main office. And, uh, you know, it had a, a kitchen for making food and stuff and uh, with high power points, three phase and, and stainless steel worktops and, um, and so essentially they moved into new offices and gave him their old offices and uh, it has uh, a fume hood and, and several work stations, uh, one of which uh, was where the 225 day test was conducted. And uh, he has a rather, rather swanky private office and, and then a, um, a, a, another uh, large, reasonably large office space with several desks in there with uh, a, a variety of different microscopes on it so that they can study the materials uh, and so forth. Uh, and uh, um, Zhigalov worked with him for quite some time um, and uh, produced that uh, excellent, in my opinion, uh, statistical study um, of uh, strange radiation. Now, he didn't only observe... Uh, there's a couple of points to this. So um, the strange radiation coming from his 225-day test, uh, Zhigalov noted that uh, it kind of comes and goes, and they didn't really know what was meaning it was coming and going. I said, I, I postulated a couple of reasons. Uh, one could be possibly that um, uh, there's uh, some interaction with the lunar cycle, um, and that kind of plays into... Uh, the uh, neutrino flux variation uh, of which uh, Alexander Parkamov is the world's expert. And this, uh, I, I added weight to that argument by uh, citing that people that tried to replicate, replicate the seed transmutation germination uh, studies, uh, uh, um, uh, I think it's Kevriel, Kevrian, I can't re remember <laughs> the exact way of pronouncing that French guy's name. But uh, anyway, um, they were had mixed success. Some some had the transportation, some didn't. But I think in 2013 there was an Indian group, and they did a study where I think they uh, set seeds growing every 
two uh, two weeks or so on and uh, what they found or every week or something for over the course of a year and what they found was within cer with with certain phases of the moon there was no transmutation this sort of potassium calcium transmutation for instance um uh, and in other phases the moon there was so there really is an auspicious day to be planting seeds uh, you know or rather auspicious time during a month and uh, so th that that would suggest that there's some sort of interaction between uh, the moon and the earth and the, and the sun maybe that allows uh, for a burst of whatever is necessary to get seeds to grow uh, better uh, and be able to take elements that they have available to them and transmute them to the elements they need so um, potentially it's uh, the the moon that's phased but in the evening we were having a chat uh, with uh, Shishkin and he said uh, he uses a, a kind of cavity uh, cavitation generator to produce his strange radiation um, uh, like a, a sort of watered down version of uh, uh, Leclerc's uh, cavitators and and it's kind of like a, a, some sort of spinning disc uh, with a, a tight boundary and I think the, the spinning needs to be around about 5,000 revolutions per minute I think it was maybe 5,400 that specific one uh, and you get the strange radiation of it but he said what's really interesting is that he can fire it up he gets his strange radiation strange radiation and then it stops hmm and then if he moves the generator to a different part of the lab like some distance away and then start spinning it again, it produces strange radiation again. And Shishkin is postulating, and you know, as 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 you might consider, it because you're just looking at the evidence, that there is something in the area around everything, and and the strange radiation generator is basically sucking that in within its field of influence, condensing it into the strange radiation and emitting it. And once it's used all of the material that it can gain access to within its field of influence, he then has to move that to another part of the lab. So I suggested to Zhigalov that they put a Parkamov reactor on uh, some, uh, like, a, like a steel uh, uh, tray trolley, uh, and uh, which sort of thing that uh, Alan Goldwater has in his uh, lab. And then, like, leave it, and, and when he sees no strange radiation coming out, then move it to a different part of the lab and see if he gets strange radiation again. So, um, you know, we're we're in a whole new space here. Uh, uh, this is something that uh, you know you've got to try, and 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 I think that's a good bit of guidance from Shishkin. There uh, is the observation repeatable with. Um, uh, you know, uh, with a Parkamov reactor, if it is, it's just a little bit weird. <laughs> anyway, it's called strange radiation after all, after Arudskarev uh, gave it its name, but uh, it, it, that particular name. So, um, uh, so that was uh, talking. So, so um, go back to um, Alexander Parkamov's lab. Really, really neat. He's got a is a very clean preparation area, a fume hood, so he doesn't have to be breathing in nanoparticles of of nickel or whatever else. Um, uh, all the right equipment, uh, a new computer, so he's not suffering with the, a nineteen eighties Toshiba brick laptop or whatever it is. Um, and uh, yeah, so it really, and 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 it was quite interesting because uh, he 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 went through a presentation of. Uh, <laughs> his history in this field and his history was like just a little bit after when I uh, before I met him and he was like showing his first reactors that, that were actually the reactors that I saw when I visited him in February 2015 so it, it was uh, it was a really nice thing to be um, you know just see how fast he's gone and th this is because it, he he saw something he he could see some plausibility in it and he just went for it like a dog at a bone and and uh, did experiment 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 and, and not worrying does it look pretty do people believe me whether it's got excess heat do people believe this blah 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 just do it and do it and do it and do it and uh um, respect to the man really respect anyway he showed me a number of other um uh, 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 
apparatus. One of them uh, is like a glass sphere where he has uh, two uh, um, uh, sort of uh, ceramic tubes where he's kind of like got a, I think it's a cement of like a, a, a nickel that's loaded on, on the outside. And then he does like a glow discharge between them. And uh, he says that that device has a COP of three. Um, there's one that's in the pa paper that's been uh, um, uh, uh, made available. And it's the woodpecker. And uh, essentially, I love this experiment. I love this experiment because it does one of the most important things you can do when you're trying to do these experiments. And that is, it has a parameter space covered. And by that, I mean, like, if you took uh, Chalani's wire, uh, you have these um, uh, mica supports and the wire goes over them. And w we identified with thermal imaging camera that uh, uh, when we're doing the Chalani replications, that uh, where the wire touches the uh, uh, mica support, it's much colder, and as it gets into the center, it's hotter, and so you have these thermal gradients. Um, and this this led me to when I when I went to ICCF 18, and I, and I saw um, the uh, Lena lab there, and they were trying to do a Chalani replication. They had the wire. I said that's not going to work, and they said it didn't work. And and I, and I said, well, I can tell you why it's not going to work. It's because you've got a piece of ceramic and you're winding the wire around it, and you've got an internal like heat source or whatever. But what what my point was is there was literally no parameter space. It was all one temperature. So um, in in um, Piantelli's reactor, he had a thermal. Uh, uh, gradient from one end to the other and the reaction occurred at a very small spot along the length of the uh, rod which was the critical temperature and and by having the gradient you're always going to get somewhere that's at the critical temperature um, so uh, what uh, Alexander Parkhamov has done is it's, it's, it's so just so Parkhamov um, he has like let's imagine you're doing your Carbon rod, carbon rod. I think that's what you're seeing. But they, they, he's actually done a whole series of experiments using different materials like uh, copper electrodes or, or uh, onto a copper plate or, or all kinds of different things um, uh, looking at transmutation. But in the case of uh, that particular one that's in, in the presentation, he's got a carbon rod onto a carbon plate underwater. And it goes up and down like this. And the, the way it works is uh, the carbon rod drops. Uh, and it conducts, produces a high current, and there's an inductor, and uh, the induction uh, uh, does two things. And I, I don't know the specific configuration, but some electricians could work this out. Basically, there's one part of it that acts as a solenoid. When it conducts, it pulls up. But of course, um, there's also a component that uh, causes a very uh, high uh, uh, voltage spike. And 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 the, what the combination of the things it goes it goes down, um, it goes up. Uh, it creates the high voltage spike. Uh, it, you know, kind of basically in sync with the contact. And 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 as as uh, it's coming up, it's changing the parameter space for the arc discharge. It's changing changing the current. It's changing the thing. So it's it's it, every single hit, it's going over a range of parameter space. Um, uh, absolute genius, absolute genius. And the other thing it gets round is you might have an optimum distance, but with any discharge, you start wearing away the electrodes. It gets round that because it, it goes down and it goes over a range of distances. Um, so, you, you know, you might have a reactor that works for a few seconds, but you're never going to be able to make something useful out of that. Um, but this going up and down, it's always covering the parameter space. So... I like the woodpecker. It's a fantastically garage novel way of doing uh, these kind of art discharges, and and so full respect. So that that was very very stimulating. Uh, uh, then uh, after that, uh, uh, I had supper and went out, and I joined a kind of like round table um, uh, with uh, Shishkin, and uh, he. Uh, went through the construction of his um, uh, strange radiation detector. And basically, he's using a neutron detector made from boron-10 coated inside, normally runs at one kilovolt uh, with electronics and, and a pulse output taken to a, a, a computer or an oscilloscope. And the normal trace is 
is kind of it produces a half volt output. It's quite smooth and so forth. Uh, he found that if he lowered the uh, voltage, bias voltage, to I think 590 volts, um, uh, when it's put next to a strange radiation emitter, when the strange radiation emitter comes in, I think you have a seven nanosecond pulse and and then a 50 nanosecond pulse. Uh, so you have a little v, which is like some sort of initiation process, and then a big drop. And it produces a signal of 12 volts plus, so 24 times more the signal that you would get from uh, a neutron uh, going into this uh, former neutron detector. And a couple of points that I want to make about that. One is it's a really novel use of others, uh, another type of system um, to uh, uh, detect strange radiation uh, with, with small modifications. So these, these kind of boron-10 tubes are, are, are quite common. Uh, however, the other thing I had in the back of the mind, uh, if you recall, is the boron nitride interaction with nickel and hydrogen and the, the fact that uh, uh, Piantelli's in, internals were made of MACOR, which is a high concentration of boron, and also that we didn't have success with uh, Chalani replication number one because we changed the uh, uh, sheath uh, tube for the, for the Stefan Boltzmann calculation and, and, and containment to quartz because Chalani was going to do that. But then um, uh, when the second replication was done by Matthew Vallat in France, uh, Ryan Hunt did the first uh, attempt, but we all agreed that that's what we're going to do because Chalani was going to do it. But then Matthew Vallat did a uh, uh, the experiment that started on the 12th, the 12th, the 12th, 12 seconds past 12, blah, blah, blah. It was the perfect time to start the experiment. Um, uh, he, when he did that experiment, uh, the um, uh, glass had been replaced by borosilicate, which has boron in it. Now, okay, there's only 20% boron, 10 in uh, natural boron. Um, but uh, then um, uh, after I was mentioning that, then... Uh, 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 Anatoly Klimov said uh, his uh, dusty plasma uh, uh, vortex uh, generator, which he's uh, given me an invite to go and uh, uh, witness and and and, and test. Um, uh, this uh, has um, uh, inserts uh, of different elements, and one of the elements he chooses is boron, and he gets much higher COP than just having the normal uh, nickel electrode. I think we're getting a pattern here. So it, it looks like the strange radiation can, it can interact with other uh, elements favorably, um, but it, it seems to uh, do uh, things uh, if, if one is uh, always present, uh, then uh, it seems uh, that it does interact with boron. Uh, this is very interesting. Is it because of the wonky neutron? I don't know because the, the, the neutron detectors are, um, uh, like I say, boron 10. Uh, uh, anyway, that, that's just, uh, it was wonderful uh, of Alexander Shishkin to share that design for uh, a strange radiation detector. So out of this conference, we've got a number of uh, different ways of, uh, to shield. Uh, potentially, we've got an understanding of, of maybe that it can be an intermittent thing. So if you don't always have strange radiation, you know, you can't, someone comes in and tests that you don't have strange radiation. It might be that you've used all of, of the stuff up in the available environment, or, uh, you know, maybe um, it's got the cyclical nation that, nature that's uh, working with the, the moon. And, and so, you know, you could get someone to come in to test it to, when when the moon is in a certain phase, knowing that they're not going to see radiation. Or, um, you know, maybe it, it reaches a threshold and spits out strange radiation. It's like shedding excess, and then, and then it drops down below a threshold, and it's like some sort of hysteresis going on. So, um, but it's so exciting, really so exciting to 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 see so many different approaches, so many different ways of analysing it, and it, and and it's it's like a it really feels like a a a, a collegiate race. It's like um, it, I I imagine it's kind of like uh, you're running. You have to I don't know. It's like you're all carrying a boat to get into the water to catch the fish, and 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 they're all kind of working together and sharing ideas and and and, and really actually not just sharing the ideas. It's saying exactly how to do it. And, and one thing you will see in the in the round table, uh, uh, not the round table, but the conversation uh, between Parkamov and and, and Baranov and, and Zaletovin, 
um, is Letterpin is saying, uh, Alexander, you need to stop using metal on the outside of your calorimeter because you're wasting the strange radiation. It will leave and it, 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 you'll lose the potential for excess the heat there. So he's of the opinion that you can use the strange radiation uh, and, and uh, you know, you would kind of think that's true given the fact that strange radiation seems to be able to uh, tear matter apart, uh, whatever it is, transmute matter and so forth. So uh, if it's transmuting matter, is that giving us uh, a net, net gain? Anyway, absolutely fascinating. Uh, I, I will try and answer as many comments as uh, uh, um, questions that, that you have. Uh in the coming days and uh, I've got lots of media to kick out uh, uh, videos of presentations and, and, and other things so uh, thank you for your time and I'm going to go and get to bed after I've uploaded this